Everyone, remain calm. Yeah, ooh, ah, that's how it always starts. But then later there's running and then screaming. Somebody talk to me, what is happening? Welcome to Jurassic World. You're listening to the Jurassic Park Podcast. You want to consult here or in my bungalow? <laughs> Hold on to your butt. Well, we're back. Hello and welcome to the 124th episode of the Jurassic Park Podcast. I'm your host, Brad Jost, and we're here to discuss all things Jurassic Park. In this episode, we present episode 10 of Extinction Level Jurassic Park from Arjun Boss. Last time in Extinction Level, we heard an amazing raptor battle in progress and investigated a migrating dinosaur. This time, we're going to continue tracking down that dinosaur and also revisit the compound from the island escape in the Lost World. Following that, I'll feature my usual after-segment breakdown of Extinction Level, highlighting all the most interesting details from that episode. And then to close out the show, we'll take a trip into a brand new segment, the Innovation Center with Tom Fishenden. In this installment, Tom will take a look at the dinosaur-inspired British television show, Primeval. Now, this isn't something that I ever saw, so I'm really interested to hear what Tom has to say. Tom has been with us for a few episodes so far, showcasing a lot of fan art and different things like that. But for the new segment, in the Innovation Center, Tom will take a look at the ways the dinosaur genre and, of course, Jurassic Park innovate our thinking. Whether it's fan art, community spotlights, something a bit poetic, or something dinosaur-related, Tom will find something that relates to us all. After hearing what Tom has brought us so far, I'm super excited to see what he puts together as time goes on here on the podcast. Again, this week, I'm going to ask you, if you haven't already, give us a five-star review on iTunes. Stop listening right now. Give us that five-star review. Trust me, it helps. But anyway, why don't we move on from the intro and dive into episode 10 of Extinction Level Jurassic Park. Previously on Extinction Level Jurassic Park. I hear you aspire to join the Navy, but have some issue with anxiety from previous experiences. Who told you? Never mind that. I could use your help on Isla Sorna. I think it is the only way to overcome your fear. People living on Isla Medanceras. I need to go there as soon as possible. Dr. Harding. What brings you back to Isla Sorna? My father is helping Dr. Wu with the animals on the island. Hola. Soy Dr. Marika Diaz. Me llamo Andrea. Eso es un compi. Vic, it seems they crashed somewhere north of the landing strip. Something spooked the hadrosaurus! Velociraptors, not a peck. Their behavior reminds me of rivaling lion pride. But then you have too many raptors. Episode 10 Arrival. On the beach on Isla Matraceros, Marika Diaz was sitting crouched down along the jungle line at the beginning of the beach. Waves crashing on a sandy beach along the right into the distance. Looking down, Marty follows three toed tracks in the sand, pointing with his finger. The tracks continue into the jungle. Big birds or dinosaurs. A villager comes walking up to him, Gonzalo, the man who came with him to show the spot where they had found the howler monkey eating the consignatus. You find anything? Tracks, but they're gone. And there is no other sign that they're still around here. What's that? Guitarist looks back at Gonzalo, who was pointing a little further along the jungle line. Following Gonzalo's finger, Guitero sees the small black shape lying in between the low foliage in the distance. He gets up and fast walks along the jungle line to the shape to discover the lifeless body of a howler monkey. Guitero carefully turns it over to make sure the monkey is dead. Then he looks up at Gonzalo. Let's take it back with us carefully, I need to examine it. Where can I do my research? Going through the open gate roof, Masrani's helicopter lands on a helipad in the center of the worker village. Sarah looks at the restored operations building at the far end, remembering the rescue four years earlier. They touch the ground, and as the sound of the blades dies, Masrani and Raymond get out. Raymond opens the door for Sarah and Tim, and as Masrani reaches their side of the helicopter, they are greeted by Dr. Henry Wu. Welcome to Site B, Dr. Harding! Tim! So pleased to meet you. Likewise. Simon Masrani, holding the package he received from Sarah, now hands it to Henry. 
Henry, your order has arrived. Ah, finally. Thank you, sir. Signaling everyone to follow him. Follow me. They start walking towards a two-story building. Raymond stays behind to take care of the helicopter. I or Dr. Wu here will be happy to answer any question you might have. Sarah jumps at this opportunity, looking up. Why the roof? When Injun abandoned this place in the 90s, they freed all the animals, including a few pteranodons, which were supposed to be moved to the aviary on Nublar. But wouldn't they fly away from the islands? Well, on Nublar, the adults showed to be extremely territorial, so we didn't think they would leave. I hear a butt in there. Yes, well, when we returned here, some had in fact moved to Isla Tucano in the east. He wants to respond to this, shocked. But Masani cuts in. How? Moving back to your question, the ones here in Sorna tended to respond with aggression and attack the village a few times, try to chase us away. Which is why we installed the roof here. The aggression may also be why some of the animals relocated to Tucano. Then why do you leave the roof open? It's no longer necessary. We built an aviary here on Sorna. Scrap metal, but strong enough to hold the recaptured animals contained here, including runs from Tocanio. They arrived at a two-story building, but before they entered, a man approached them and addresses Masrani. Sir. What is it? We have a situation. Can it wait? A small private jet crash landed earlier today, just north of the landing strip. Henry, can you take our guests to the animal's quarter? Of course. Dr. Hardin, I bet you had liked to see your father. Yes. I must ask your forgiveness. I will be with you again shortly. As Ronnie walks away with the worker to the control tower. Please, follow me. Sarah and Tim follow Henry Wu inside. In this episode you heard James Hawkins as Guterres, Francisco Gasco as Gonzalo, Emmett Misra as Masrani, Ross Lane as Henry Wu, Jenna Viterg as Sarah Harding and Brad Jost as the control worker. Until next time. So there you have it. That's episode 10 of Extinction Level Jurassic Park. This one was called Arrival. And, uh, you know, there is quite a bit to decipher here in this one. I had to listen to it a few times because there is a ton of details that I wanted to kind of go over in my head and figure out a little bit more. Um, in the start of this one, we find Marty Gutierrez. We've been following him for a few episodes now. And he's on a beach tracking down some footprints. And uh, I guess this is the spot where previously we've seen that a, a howler monkey was eating on, the, I guess, the remains of that compi, um, which is probably, I think that's the one that was stored in the fridge, if I remember correctly. Um, now, the thing is, they track down these footprints, these three-toed footprints, and it goes in this one direction, and in that direction they find a dead howler monkey. So, what does that mean for you know this story is there another compi or is there more dinosaurs or is there something with that compi that you know caused this thing to die like maybe you know this dead compi is there rotting or, or some sort of bacteria i don't know but i wonder what caused this monkey to die it kind of i feel like it's kind of brushed off as a quick mo uh, moment in this this series here but i feel like there's more to it so um, you know, this story with, with Gutierrez is really interesting because we kind of get small glimpses here and there. We don't actually get a full story, so it's moving along very slowly, but I love the, the mood that he's setting here, the, the details that um, Arjun has put together here, whether it's the score and, and the, the sound of the, the ocean nearby, all these little details that make it ominous and, and very curious as to what's going on in this particular part of the story so like I said I'm really interested to see where this one goes but that's actually just a quick segment of this uh, episode of Extinction Level from there it moves on to the helicopter that we've kind of been following the past few episodes Mizrani's chopper kind of goes down it seems like through an open gate roof of some sort which is kind of new I've never heard of something like that I guess in this series so that's interesting it kind of goes down through this gate that's kind of I guess an enclosure of sorts lands on a helipad at a worker village and from there you know Sarah Harding who's on this chopper sees the restored operations building and she recognizes it as the place that they were rescued a few years earlier obviously from the lost world uh, so that's a really nice touch there I kind of I kind of like these characters um, revisiting these spots and kind of like having PTSD in a way and like kind of like thinking oh my gosh like that's where that took place like uh, I forget if it was the last or the one before that where Tim is like 
you know, kind of reliving the moment there on the grass. Uh, I think it was a Gallimimus scene. But here we have them landing. Dr. Wu is there to welcome them to Site B. Um, it's funny because, you know, Sarah's already been there. But um, as Ronnie gets out, I guess he hands a package to Dr. Wu. I completely forget. I don't know if we know what's in that or not. Um, but if we don't, I'm excited to find out what it is. And uh, they, they get the sense that there's, uh, well, not the sense, but there is a giant roof, I guess, over top of this uh, this segment of the, the island here. Um, we learn that InGen abandoned the island back in the 90s, and they freed all the animals, and I guess that's what we see um, in the Lost World. We see all these animals kind of just, you know, doing their own thing, roaming around, free reign in the island. Um, and eventually, I guess they planned on moving the Pteranodons to Nublar, the aviary that's that's there. Um, but I guess they, they couldn't do that. A lot of the Pteranodons were, uh, I guess, very aggressive. And they didn't think that some would leave the island, but some did on Isla Tacano. So that's interesting there. Um, so what they did is, I guess, they built this roof. And now it seems like they leave this roof open. And they're starting to, I guess, recapture some of these animals, put them into a new aviary on Sorna, which is obviously something we know from Jurassic Park 3. We know that there's an aviary there. Um, so as we're, as we stand right now, we're in the timeline of Jurassic Park 3. So the plane has just crashed, and the you, you'd have to assume all that stuff's going down where they're trying to escape the uh, the Spinosaurus. The Spinosaurus is attacking the plane. All that's happening, and they're you know going off into the jungle as this is happening in a different section of the island. So that's it's really cool to think about that happening at the same time. So that makes me wonder because they mentioned this aviary was built. I, I think they said it was built from scraps or something like that, and so. It doesn't look like it's very maintained well. I don't know, because obviously stuff's falling apart. Like, stuff's not well maintained, and obviously, maybe it's the scraps. I don't know, maybe they just didn't put it together well. But it is kind of interesting to think about the Pteranodons that we see in, at the end of the Lost World. Maybe they've been captured, or they've escaped to a different island or somewhere else. Um, either way, it's cool to think about. At least they're trying to, you know, herd these things back together and put them, you know, in a cage of some sort. Which obviously doesn't really work out in the end of the, uh, Jurassic Park 3. Um, so at this point, a control worker lets Mizrani know that there's the, the crashed plane on Sorna. So he's kind of like updating Mizrani as what's going on here. At that point, I guess everybody splits up, goes in different directions. And I'm sure we're going to find out more about all that soon enough. I, I just love this. It's, it's so interesting to me because it's, there's so much, um, uh, you know, intrigue and all that. I, I'm just loving where Gutierrez is going, his story, trying to track down this this dinosaur. I'm also loving all the tie-ins that we're getting through the other story, um, kind of wrapping up and kind of tying things together that we almost didn't know we wanted, which is really cool. And again, I just wanted to point out, um, it looks like we have a few tracks here that are really cool, non-JP tracks. We have Field of Dreams, uh, the track, I guess, is the cornfield, and uh, one from Dragonheart uh, called Mexican Standoff. I feel like Arjun, you know, man, you really know your scores well because I feel like, I don't know, you just pinpoint these tracks that have nothing to do with JP and just kind of fit them in perfectly, weave them in really great, and everything fits well. I love it. It sets the tone. Like I said, it makes me really interested to see what happens next. Great job, everybody involved, and I can't wait to see what happens next in episode 11 in a few weeks. Yeah, six kids in the lost and found, uh, 28 down with heat stroke. All of this exists because of me. Just like taking a stroll through the woods 65 million years ago. Hello, everybody, and how are we doing? It's Tom back here today on the Jurassic Park podcast, and today we're going to be doing a bit of a new segment. 
So we're going to see how long this can last for. I've got a few ideas on what I want to talk about. If you guys are passionate about maybe something dinosaur or Jurassic related, now is your chance to actually get in touch, maybe even Skype me, join me for this segment. Okay, so the idea is that this segment will be talking about Jurassic themed content that you can fill your time with while we wait for Fallen Kingdom. So, let's jump straight into it. This segment will be covering all sorts of content from television shows, films, books, games, merchandise, everything that I feel I can kind of recommend to you guys to fill your time before Fallen Kingdom. So, for this episode, I'm going to be starting with what is quite possibly one of my favourite television shows to have ever debuted on screens. It is, as some of you may have already guessed, of course, Primeval. So, Primeval was a sci-fi show by Impossible Pictures, which was set in the modern day with dinosaurs from the past coming through to the future through cracks in time known as anomalies. Now, these anomalies led to a series of different situations which thrust characters into heart-wrenching and action-packed scenarios where different creatures would get on the loose in different locations and would potentially pose a risk to the public. Now, the show itself was quite critically acclaimed. It was made by Impossible Pictures, the guys behind Walking with Dinosaurs, so it was a really well done show in terms of CGI and everything like that. And it actually ran for five seasons with the main UK team before it also got a one season spin off set in Canada called Primeval New World. Okay, so in the first few seasons, we follow a band of characters including Cutter, Stephen Hart, um, Abby, Connor, those two who remain consistent for all five series. Um, characters such as Captain Ryan and really it was all about the kind of the government's effort to hide these dinosaurs whilst getting paleontolo paleontological there we go experts to actually come in and try and deal with these situations and keep them as covert as possible while stopping the public from being put at risk it was something which I always found really exciting because I think in terms of just every kind of genre it's always nice to think about what could be right in front of us. What, so, like, what's there that we don't know exists but is actually happening at the moment around us. So in this respect, I'm clearly referencing the idea that the government could potentially be dealing with something like this and that we as general members of the public would never know. We would never be made aware of this unless there was some kind of breach in containment or something like that. So it's quite an exciting concept. It's not too ground in reality although the dinosaurs featured in it are really really nicely done and it does actually try and offer some scientific explanation at some points throughout the show which is again something that's really nicely done. In terms of the creatures we see across the show we get a nice variety of creatures. We see some dinosaurs who you will all be familiar with, we get a... I don't want to say Velociraptor, I think it is a... Oh. Ooh, I cannot remember. It's not the Velociraptor, and it's not the Pyroraptor. It's another kind of raptor from the Jurassic era, I believe. Can't remember what one it is off the top of my head, but it was really cool seeing a feathered Velociraptor. Uh, I've said Velociraptor again, you get what I mean. It was also really nice seeing a T-Rex. Um, I'm trying to think off the top of my head what else. Uh... There were, you know, a couple of dinosaurs from Jurassic Park, but the main premise here was really kind of dinosaurs that we hadn't seen on the main screen before. So there was the Carnotaurus, um, and in addition to that, Primeval actually featured a Mosasaur before Jurassic World did, which was quite cool to see. I always remember there's this scene where it just pops its head out on the, uh, of the water, and the two main characters, Abby and Connor, are running to the side of the embankment. They're trying to fend it off with an oar from a boat. And that scene has honestly stuck with me since childhood because it terrified me. Because obviously with aquatic dinosaurs, nine times out of ten, you don't see them until they get you. That's it. You're done. Game over. So that was something which I guess as a kid I really liked. And 
it scared me, but it was a good kind of scare. It really got me invested in the franchise. In terms of technology as well, the franchise has developed a lot of interesting things over the um, course of the show. Again, actually, almost, I want to say, rivaling Jurassic World here, in terms of the fact that in the first few seasons, we see special forces soldiers using actual ballistic-based weaponry to kill the creatures, but later on in the show, we then transfer to these almost modified tasers that they use to st stun the creatures and then send them back through the portals. So again, almost rivaling the equipment the ACU use in Jurassic World. So really we get a lot of technical innovation, um, other kinds of devices which really push forward the storyline that I don't want to talk about too much because I don't want to ruin it. But really we do here see a kind of really nice high-tech look at dinosaur containment in the modern day, I suppose. In terms of the spin-off, it was hated by a lot of people. I re-watched it recently. I honestly can't see why. I mean, I think watching Primeval first is important. The quality of the storytelling here isn't as good as the UK show, the first five seasons, which were the primary ones. That's, you know, there. I think it's because... Um, in the first series, they had a lot longer to kind of build up the characters, whereas compared to New World, after being used to the same characters for so long, it is naturally hard to adapt to new characters. But I actually really liked to hear how they were willing to go out and show how another country might be responding to the same phenomenon. The difference here being that here the Canadian Special Forces, because it's set in Canada, are actually doing a lot more. They're more taking control of everything, they're silencing people who are finding things. So it was really interesting seeing those kind of conflicting, I guess, techniques in terms of dealing with this kind of incursion. And this is something which I find fascinating as a Jurassic fan, as it really makes me contemplate what kind of response would we see from the in-canon government of Jurassic World if... Um, Say, for example, some creatures from Lockwood Manor were to escape. What kind of response would we see? Um, things like that are definitely the kind of topics that I like to question, I like to theorise about. So having a show that supports that and actually puts some of that into a practical context is really, really nice. Um, I think that's about everything I've got to say on Primeval. Absolutely fantastic show. You can buy it for cheap now if you want it. It's a really, really good show. I cannot recommend it enough. Honestly, if you're into dinosaurs, if you're looking for something to maybe watch in the gap between Jurassic World and Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, buy Primeval. You won't regret that decision. You need to appreciate the fact that it is a sci-fi flick, but it features dinosaurs and the way the dinosaurs are presented is fantastic. Okay, that's everything from me today, guys. Thanks for tuning in as always, and until the next time, I hope you have a good week. Are you hearing this? Make sure to visit JurassicParkPodcast.com to find all our past episodes, brand new news articles, information on how to contact us, and much more. It's a great source for everything related to the podcast, and of course, Jurassic Park and Jurassic World. Head to JurassicParkPodcast.com and help us build a great community. Anybody hear that? Thanks for listening to the 124th episode of the Jurassic Park Podcast. Of course, a big thanks to Arjun for another great installment of Extinction Level Jurassic Park. Of course, let's give a big hand for all the performers in this episode as well. Um, another worthy installment to the Extinction Level series as usual, and I'm super intrigued to see where this one goes next. Also, thanks to Tom Fishenden for taking a look at the project that inspires him and offering something that Jurassic fans may find innovative in its own way. For myself, I'm certainly interested in visiting Primeval after hearing him talk about it, and I hope you are too. If you want to interact with us, we do most of our work over on Twitter, at Jurassic Park Pod. We're also on Facebook at facebook.com slash Jurassic Park Podcast. And our Instagram handle is at Jurassic Park Podcast. You can listen to us via iTunes, Google Play, Podomatic, YouTube, our website, or wherever else podcasts are found. So make sure to subscribe to automatically get new episodes every week. If you haven't already, please give us a five-star review on iTunes or a great review wherever you listen to the podcast. It will seriously help our rankings and make it easier for fans like you to find us. We're usually spotted commenting on the Jurassic Park subreddit as Jurassic Park Podcast. 
Don't forget to check out JurassicParkPodcast.com for all the links you heard here today. If you want to get a hold of us, you can email us with any news stories, MP3s, comments, or if you want to debut a segment of your own, send them to JurassicParkPod at gmail.com. Or you can submit questions directly on our website contact form. If you'd like to record something for the show, send it in to us and we'll feature it in an upcoming episode. If you don't have any way to record, you can give our voicemail line a call and leave us a message. That number is 732-825-7763. Thanks for listening and enjoy. No, I'm, I'm simply saying that life uh, finds a way. Five minutes. Drop what you're doing and leave now.